This episode is rated P for physics, M for mathematics, and R for reality. So it should be almost as fun as a room full of monkeys sucking filthy German exhaust. If you want to know about the merits of this apparent plague of newfangled small turbo petrol engines, you'll just have to cop that on the chin. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where Aussie new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. This report is, in a sense, completely self-serving because I am entirely sick of writing people these bespoke war and peace responses to this kind of question. The new Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross has a 1.5 engine with a turbo and seems to do the job, but we are a little worried about that it may be underpowered, although the fuel economy seems good. You can pretty much cross out Eclipse Cross and insert similar widespread consumer reservations about Honda's 1.5 turbo engine and Hyundai Kia's 1.6. For a non-technically literate person, they do seem to be pretty small engines. I get that. And I guess if you grew up before the internet, a 1.5 or 1.6 litre engine does seem insufficient to the task of dragging the sorry ass of a mid-sized SUV all over town. But perception is not reality. While you were perhaps unconscious, Rip Van winkling away the past three decades, in addition to that pesky internet, internal combustion underwent something of a revolution with the introduction of electronic fuel injection, variable valve timing, direct injection, and of course, turbocharging. And just to smash those rose-coloured glasses of retrospectivity, a 1990 Honda Civic had a 1.5 engine and a carburetor. Remember those? It developed 73 peak kilowatts and 122 peak newton metres. Now, if we fast forward almost three decades to today, the capacity there has not changed, but the output certainly has. The 1.5 litre turbo engine in the Honda CRV is 140 kilowatts and 240 newton metres. The performance has doubled in those 30 years as a result of engineering brainiacery. Another non-word that cries out, in my view, to be included in the lexicon stat. Today's 1.5 turbo goes about the same as a 3-litre Atmo engine from back in the day before Dirty Harry needed a Zimmer frame to grease punks with that enormous six-shooter. People also ask me about wear and tear, you know, such a small engine wound up so tight, surely it will wear out quicker. And this seems logical, but it is also bullshit. These things are integrated designs and manufacturers do a great deal of accelerated life testing and they put engines through hell in R&D to ensure that all the bits work together to deliver reasonable durability. Now, obviously, they don't always get that right, but mostly they do. So there's no reason to infer premature failure from a 1.5 or 1.6 litre turbo engine. I'd bear in mind, however, that turbos are driven by exhaust gas, so they get really hot. Exhaust outlet temperatures near the manifolds can be in the region of 850 degrees C when you're up it for the rent. The driven side of the turbo is swimming in high temperature exhaust gas and it is lubricated by engine oil. So it is entirely fair to say that turbos are very hard on engine oil. And for this reason, I would not be disrespecting the service interval. Blowing up a turbo is far more expensive than just getting the damn car serviced on time. Nor would I be shutting the engine down immediately after a hard run. If you do that, you can sign the lubricating oil in a hot turbo housing at the time that the car is shut down. It is going to be in literally a living hell. There's a section of road I use routinely for road test evaluations. You've seen it. It's a 200 metre vertical climb over about 4,000 metres of twisty road right near my joint with about a dozen places where you can use full throttle out of the bends. And there's a cafe right at the top, perfect, called Pie in the Sky, appropriately enough. (music) 
so the wrong way to do this, right, is to thrash the car to the top of the hill, then pull in, shut down, and order a double espresso. It's a really good idea to idle the engine for a couple of minutes to bleed that heat out of the turbo housing, no matter how caffeine deficient you might feel in the moment. Now, Kelvin says, I was chatting forced induction with the girlfriend. She's a mechanical engineer. No need to look at me like that. And I found this statement online. Though turbos do increase back pressure on the engine, they derive power primarily from otherwise wasted exhaust heat as opposed to exhaust flow pressure. Kelvin goes on, surely it is exhaust gas flow that does the work. Can you adjudicate us with one of your awesome video efforts? I'd be happy to, Kelvin. You know, having an engineering girlfriend is very brave indeed. Still, Chicks who can solve differential equations are generally very hot where it counts. They're usually wound up so tight, and when you hit that release valve, it's often quite spectacular. That's what I heard. So, let's see if Kelvin's engineering hottie approves of this. That quoted statement about turbos is bullshit. Heat does not make turbos work. The driven side of a turbo is a fan, and fans are driven by flow. You can put a turbo in the oven, it's not going to spin, right? So here's how this really works. Turbos increase the volumetric efficiency of engines by jamming more air into them. More air means you can burn more fuel. More fuel means you can derive more work at the crankshaft. And that's why these 1.5 and 1.6 turbo engines perform about the same as a good 2.5 litre Atmo engine, like the Mazda 2.5 Sky Active engine in the Mazda 3, Mazda 6 and CX-5. The output's very similar. You can look at those engines and even tell how much boost is happening in the blown ones, at least in the ballpark. Simple. 2.5 divided by 1.5 is about 66% more, so the boost is about 0.6 or 0.7 bar worth of peak boost coming out of the turbo. One bar is about one atmosphere. So the boost is about 10 PSI if you think in Imperial, or about 500 millimetres of mercury if you want to be a totally obtuse engineering nerd or girlfriend. So that's not all that much boost, which means you can use a pretty small turbo with low rotational inertia, which spools up pretty fast and mitigates lag. And it helps with durability generally as well. And it really pumps up the power production in the low and mid RPM range. Because I am totally an obtuse nerd and I sympathise with other totally obtuse nerds, one of society's most repressed groups, and I sense deep down in the force that you want to get in touch with your own totally obtuse inner nerd too. Here's the detail of how that turbocharger does its thing. When the spark plug fires, okay, the mixture burns, pressure increases in the cylinder and the piston gets shoved down in the bore because engines. The exhaust valve opens before the piston reaches the bottom of its cycle, bottom dead centre, and there is still a lot of pressure in that cylinder relative to the atmosphere. So if you're an engine designing propeller head, you could hypothetically use that pressure to push the piston even more. But if you do that, by opening the exhaust valve a little later on, the engine would need to do more work, like a pump, to eject the spent exhaust gas. And engines are not pumps, but they do incur pumping losses. So you have to choose a Goldilocks moment in time to open the exhaust valve, which balances work against pumping losses. And the upshot of that is that the exhaust rushing past the valve is still expanding quite rapidly as it vents down the pipe into atmosphere. Pressure on the engine side of the turbo is much higher than the end of the exhaust pipe and therefore you get flow. For exactly the same reason, water emerges from the garden hose when you open <laughs> the cock. Yes!
the exhaust gas has mass, and flow with mass equals all the energy you ever need to drive a turbo. Actually, there's too much energy in the flow at times, which is why turbo installations have waste gates, which is just a fancy schmancy name for a bypass valve. Waste gates are a great idea because they stop the turbo working so hard that it pumps up the pressure to the point that something down there breaks or melts because that's bad. So I guess you could say that heat ultimately drives the flow. Uh, fundamentally, heat makes engines work, right? Combustion drives the temperature up from maybe 50 degrees C on the inlet side to as much as 850 on the outlet side. That's a fourfold increase in the absolute temperature, resulting in a fourfold increase in pressure ish. Plus the boost, let's not forget that, and plus the compression ratio. And these are really rough estimates, so ballpark only for engineering luminaries and girlfriends. There are also about 50% more molecules of gas in the exhaust products than on the inlet side because chemistry. So that drives the flow up as well. But you have to bear in mind that the biggest gas component on both the inlet and outlet sides of an engine is just atmospheric nitrogen along for the ride and warmed up quite substantially. And I'm wondering at this point, is your brain hurting yet? <laughs> if it is, welcome to my world. So in short, on turbos, flow makes them go. And obviously the turbo does create resistance to exhaust flow, back pressure, but it's clearly worth it on the inlet side because they wouldn't bother otherwise. The proof is, Turbo engines go better than Atmo engines of the same volumetric capacity. The key takeouts for those of you still with me hoping to channel your inner engineering nerd and let it off the chain, an Atmo engine, suck, squeeze, bang, blow. A turbo engine, pump, squeeze, bang and blow. Yes. I don't know which I enjoy more because both are quite uplifting if done diligently. I sincerely hope engineering hottie concurs. A one point something turbo engine is sufficient to drag the sorry ass of your mid-sized SUV all over the shop. There's no doubt about that. Get it serviced on time and idle for a couple of minutes after driving hard, before shutting down, if you know what's good for you. Finally, do not disrespect chicks who can count without using their fingers. You might be pleasantly surprised. I'm John Cadogan, live in Shitsville. She'll be right, mate. Australia. Yes. My work here is done once again. Thanks for watching.